there, everybody. Welcome to the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad in Wyoming. Today is October 3rd, 2021, which means this is another layout update video. This is number 23. My name is Mark Pruitt, Spike Counter. I wanted to say thanks to everybody for all the concerns you expressed during my parathyroid surgery in August. I'm feeling fine. The pathology report said that there was some papillary cancer in the part of the thyroid they removed. So one group of surgeons has recommended removing the remainder of my thyroid. But the thyroid doctor suggests just keeping an eye on what's left of my thyroid so that I don't have to take thyroid hormone pills for the rest of my life. I'm still trying to decide what to do. But I do have one really good idea. You can kind of see the scar right here. If I have the rest of the thyroid removed, I'm going to ask the surgeon to put the next incision about half to three quarters of an inch farther down. Then I'll go to a tattoo parlor later and get the two scars connected with railroad ties. Hey, that'll sure put me in a gang, won't it? A track gang, that is. Okay, that's probably a stupid idea. Back to trains. A variety of things were done in September, and quite a lot was accomplished on the layout. So let's go take a look. At the end of last month's update, I had just tested two of the platform lights on Rocky Mountain Drilling. The day after posting that video, I finished the installation of the rest of the LEDs. I cleaned up the mess of wires under the building by installing a couple of solder pads under the floor and connecting everything up to them. Then I placed the building back on the layout and powered it up. I put a boxcar on the track next to the building and took this shot. It shows some promise, I think. And that was it for Rocky Mountain Drilling for the month. Obviously, I still have a lot to do to finish it up, like adding the signs and actually embedding it into the earth rather than having it sit unevenly on top. But I'll get back to those things maybe this month. Meanwhile, on to other things. On the 5th, I bought an Osmo Pocket 2 camera with the idea of using it to record cab ride videos of the layout. While it showed promise, the depth of focus left a bit to be desired, and the autofocus, in use in this clip, kept shifting the focus as the camera moved. I put together a video testing different fixed focal lengths for the camera, and posted it on YouTube for comments. I got quite a few, thanks for your feedback. The next day I did some more testing, including some low light recording to simulate deep twilight on the layout. I posted this video on YouTube as well, and once again got many useful comments. I'll post links to the full videos in the description for anyone who might not have seen them. Taking everything into consideration, I just wasn't happy with the Pocket 2's performance as a cab ride camera, so I returned it to the store. The earlier version of the camera, the Pocket, had slightly better specs for close-up filming than the Pocket 2, so I ordered one online. It arrived on September 13th. I ran the same tests I did on the Pocket 2 and put together a video of those results that included side-by-side -side comparisons between the Pocket and the Pocket 2. The original Pocket shows a slightly better depth of focus and less distortion thanks to its slightly narrower field of view, so I decided to keep it. You'll find a link to this full test video also in the description. Now I had a new toy, so of course I had to play with it. I took this video clip of the train running down the Chicago and Northwestern track towards Hudson above Casper. There are two things I really like about the pocket. First, the camera lens sits at about six scale feet above the ties when the camera is placed on a flat car. That gives a very realistic perspective to the ride. The second thing I like is that the camera is gimbal stabilized, meaning you don't get a lot of bone jarring motion as the car trundles across turnouts and other unprototypically rough track work. You're left primarily with the very prototypical side-to-side -side motion of the camera as the train moves down the track. 
But I didn't just play with cameras the first half of the month. I did a few other things as well. One of them was finally getting most of the boxes out of the train room. That was a huge pile, as you can see in the background of this shot. Finally, these were all removed, leaving a lot more room for expanding the layout. And where did they go? Well, most of the boxes were full of books, which all went onto the shelves of the now-finished library. On September 11th, the train room looked like this. A cluttered mess of crap stacked all over the place. I could barely even get to Casper Yard. Four days later, it looked like this. It was mostly cleaned up. Well, except for the tabletops and shelves. It's much easier to work in there now, and there's room for a lot more bench work. Now I had no more excuses. The library was done, the train room was semi-cleaned, so now it was time to get back to the layout. I started working on the scenery in the corner leading to Hudson on the upper deck. First, I laid out the painted polyfiber I talked about in last month's update. Obviously, I needed more, so I made some. This time, I added orange paint to the color of the fiber to better match the cornfields on the backdrop. After all, the polyfiber was supposed to be an extension of the backdrop onto the benchwork. Trimming the polyfiber and just laying it in place gave me this rather promising low level from the track view. I glued the polyfiber down, then weighted it to compress it a bit and make sure it stuck securely to the glue as it dried. I wound up with a pretty good pile of trimmings from the polyfiber. These came in handy a few days later. Once the glue was dry, I removed the weights the next day. The cornfield looked like this. The next step was to add some texture to the top of the corn. I sprinkled on some very fine ground foam to represent tassels and wound up with this. Before going further with the field, I had to go back and finish up the area leading into the field. I had stopped a few feet shy of the field when I was doing the line over Casper a few months earlier. That area went from this to this in a matter of a couple of hours. Now I could go back to the cornfield. I added oregano leaves at the base of the polyfiber to represent dead and decaying vegetation which makes the layout smell really nice for about a day afterwards. I also added some ground foam bushes and weeds, then applied static grass. These shots are the final result. All that's left is to add a couple of trees in the bare spots. I'll get around to those at some point in the future. So the CNW line from Riverton to Hudson is all done, right? Well, not quite. As this video clip shows, on the tangent track above Casper, the interface edge between the backdrop and the shelf is pretty jarring. Remember that pile of trimmed off polyfiber? It would be just perfect for softening the backdrop to shelf interface. While it's not perfect, that narrow strip of polyfiber does a lot to soften the edge. Let's just watch this video right into the curve at what I've taken to calling Cornfield Corner. So that's about it for the month of September, right? Well, no, not by a long shot. I said in the opening a lot was accomplished this past month, and I wasn't kidding. As I was working on the CNW line in the cornfield corner and running a train down the line recording the results, the BLI consolidation I got in April that was being used to push the flat car with the camera on it was showing some pretty odd behavior. I started investigating and ultimately produced this video of the random stopping and restarting of the locomotive. I talked with BLI's technical support folks about this. They reviewed the video which I posted on YouTube and said that behavior was not normal. They provided me with an RMA number to send the unit back for repair. It will go out in a few days. I'll also provide a link to that video in the description. Rolling back to a bit earlier in the month, I decided to reinstall the Caboose Industries ground throws on my turnouts. I just couldn't get the over-center springs to work to my satisfaction. 
The springs tended to pop off sporadically as the turnouts were being thrown, and they were a real pain to get installed so that they held the points firmly on both sides. So, with advice from the members of the Model Railroader forums as to securing the ground throws firmly with a subroad bed of pink foam, I've started reinstalling them throughout the yard. So far, they're working great. I'll finish up the entire yard over the next month or two. With the scenery on the CNW line nearly complete through Cornfield Corner, I was finally ready to move Casper into its permanent spot. One problem remained though. The benchwork tends to make little divots in the walls as it moves slightly up against them. My wife is not at all happy about that. So what I did was buy a yard of felt fabric, cut it into four inch wide strips, and staple the strips to the stringers that come in contact with the wall. This should cushion any rubbing of the benchwork against the wall over time. And with that, Casper was finally ready to be rolled into its final position. About time, too. It's been on casters and out in the middle of the room for about 14 months now. This is a time-lapse video of me moving Casper to its final location and the beginnings of replacing the casters with adjustable feet. Don't worry, I edited the half-hour video way down to get to just the good parts, if there are any good parts. A few folks suggested I just leave the casters in place, but the floor is uneven and the casters have no height adjustment. If I left them, Casper would have some undulations in the trackage, meaning cars would roll around on their own. Can't have that, so off came the casters. Besides, I have another use for the casters in the future. Once I was finished, Casper had all new feet. In its final position, Casper and the room now look like this. Holy cow! There's a lot of room for more layout here, isn't there? Finally, after over a year of construction, I'm able to begin extending the main line out of Casper, west through Powder River, and east through Douglas. So, late in the month, I started putting together the benchwork westbound. First, I had to actually design the benchwork. That only took a couple of hours in CAD rail. Armed with the plan, I cut joists and stringers and collected everything into nice, neat little stacks for assembly. Uh, hold on a minute. Neat? That's not something you see a lot around my trains. Maybe I'm not completely recovered from that surgery yet. Anyway, a couple more hours of work and I had the first two grid sections for the new bench work assembled. Why grid sections? Because the Cody branch will run below Powder River and Shoban, so I need thin bench work. No well girders in this area. After assembling the last two grid sections, I took everything into the basement and started erecting the new bench work. But wait a minute. Isn't this the area where the stereo and workbench were located? Yep, but that was always temporary. Before starting to erect the new benchwork, I moved the workbench and stereo to a new temporary spot across the room. It will probably stay here for only about another year until I start pushing eastward from Douglas. Then it'll go somewhere else. Where, I have no idea right now. Back to the benchwork. Over the last few days, I've installed the area for Powder River along the same wall Casper inhabits. Like the CNW line, the benchwork is screwed to the studs in the wall, so only the far front edge needs a leg since the near edge is fastened to the Casper benchwork. And yes, there's felt to protect the wall from this benchwork too. Funny thing, my wife isn't worried about the holes I drill into the wall, just the scuff marks from lumber scraping it. The leg at the far end is just a temporary 2x4. I installed the permanent 2x2 legs yesterday. Here's where we're at as of today. Powder River benchwork is complete, even up to installation of the 1x2s that will mount the backdrop. The section of benchwork along the far wall around the corner is where Shoban is located. That's the turnout where the Chicago and Northwestern leaves the Burlington Main Line to head towards Lander, that is, the line above Casper. Shoban is also very near the Boysen Reservoir and the southern entrance to the Wind River Canyon. With that, we're up to date. 
My apologies for the length of this update, but as you can see, there was a lot to cover. Leave me a comment on whether you think this update was too long or not. I try to keep them to 10 minutes or less, but sometimes there's just too much information. During October, I plan to install the skyboard behind Powder River and push the main line out into that area. I probably won't get all the way to Shoban, but hey, you never know. I also may put a few more finishing touches on Rocky Mountain drilling if the mood strikes. Thanks for watching everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next month.